First Wednesdays is sponsored by the Vermont Humanities Council and by the Kellogg Hubbard Library with video production supported by Orca Media. Michelle Singer, I'm the Adult Programs Coordinator here at the library. We're happy to have you here with us tonight. Uh, first Wednesdays is a program of the Vermont Humanities Council that happens the first Wednesday of the month, October through May, in nine libraries around the state of Vermont. We are very pleased to be a host for this series and happy to have you here. We'd like to thank the Vermont Humanities Council sponsors and library sponsors who have helped us bring this lecture to us tonight. The underwriters are the Institute of Museum and Library Services through the Vermont Department of Libraries, the Peter Gilbert Endowment Fund, and Pomerleau Real Estate. We appreciate their support. Information and the brochure for the First Wednesday's program are on the table out in the hall, as well as community input forms, which you're welcome to fill out tonight or take with you and fill out later. Please take this moment to silence your cell phones. Uh, take note that there's a restroom at the, at the back of the room. And I'd like to invite Tess Taylor, the Vermont Humanities Council Director of Community Programs, to introduce our speaker tonight. Welcome, Tess. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you so much, and thank you to the Kellogg Hubbard Library for everything you do for Vermont Humanities and our community. So, um, before I introduce our speaker tonight, I want to talk about, if, if anybody's been here yet, to see our new way of um, signing in. Uh, we, have, we still have our... Um, Oh, I'm trying to get this right. We still have our sign-in sheets if people prefer the old-fashioned way or the new way, um, which is to either use this adorable little tablet or even your cell phone. So you silence your cell phone. We want you to do that, but you can use it. If you go to, um, if you see at the top of the screen there, it says, bit.ly fw-montpelier. If you go there, there'll be a really quick way to put your name, uh, your first name, your last name, town you're from, and your email. And tomorrow, you'll receive a, a short email from us asking about your experience tonight. And um, it really is short, and we don't use, we don't use um, this information for anything unless you check a box in that email tomorrow and say, yes, I want to be on your mailing list and we don't share it either. So it's a, it's a safe way to do it, it's a quick way to do it, and um, we think that it's pretty effective. So I'm gonna pass this little tablet around if you wanna use that. Let's see. Oh, here you do it. Yep, got it. <laughs> so thank you for indulging me. And now on to tonight's speaker. Brandon Del Pozo was appointed Chief of Police of Burlington, Vermont in September 2015. Prior to assuming leadership of Vermont's largest municipal police force, he served for 19 years in the New York City Police Department, where he retired at the rank of Deputy Inspector. While at the NYPD, he commanded the 6th and 50th precincts, served on the staff of the Police Commissioner and Chief of Department. From 20, 2005 to 2007, he served as NYPD's intelligent liaison um, to the Arab Middle East and India, based out of Jordan's capital, the <coughs> city of Amman. Born in Brooklyn, New York, he began his police career in 1997 and patro on patrol in the 67th Precinct in East Flat Flatbush. You're pretty far from home. Yeah. Almost yeah. <laughs> where the heart is. <laughs> <laughs> Currently, Chief Del Pozo is a member of the Police Executive Research Forum. It was on the 2016 recipient of its Gary Hayes Memorial Award for Police Leadership. A graduate of Dartmouth College, Chief Del Pozo has completed the coursework for a doctorate in political philosophy from the City of New York Graduate Center. He also holds a Master's of Public Administration from the Kennedy School of Government, where he is an inaugural 9-11 Public Service Fellow, and a Master of Arts in Criminal Justice from the John Jay College, where he was a John Reichenbach Scholar. So we are so pleased and happy and lucky to have you here tonight, Chief Del Pozo. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, so as a, um, a young cop in East Flatbush, I actually lived, um, I, I worked 
down the street from um, Erasmus High School, which is where you know Bernie Sanders went to high school. And uh, you're talking about being far from home, you know, like there is this precedent for like Jewish guys from Brooklyn to come to Vermont and you know <laughs> cause trouble. Um, and you know, when when I when I met Bernie for the first time, I thought I would bond with him by. Uh, talking about, oh, I used to work down the street from where you went to uh, high school. If you know his personality, he's having none of it. He's like, I brought you here to ask you about opioids. We're going to talk about opioids now. Uh, <laughs> I could care less. Basically, the vibe was I could care less that uh, we, we were spiritual neighbors in Brooklyn. So um, thank you for having me. Thanks for the Vermont uh, Council of the Humanities for putting this together. Um, so just to, you know, I see Chief Tony Fakos in the room, chief of uh, Montpelier, so this is, I got to be careful what I say. I, got, I can't, you know, biggest police department, this and that. No, nope, no, nope, we got it. He's, uh, he's here. Alan Gilbert as well, retired from the ACLU, uh, here as well. And then Deputy Chief John Murad, uh, my chief of operations, who is uh, a native Vermonter, actually. John um, left uh, Underhill to go to college in a uh, he went to a, a college on the outskirts of Boston uh, in Cambridge, um, joined the NYPD, uh, and then after a stint there, um, went into the private sector, really, really missed police work, uh, and I happened to have an opening for a number two, so I brought uh, uh, Deputy Chief Muir back up, so thanks for, he's not like my bodyguard or something there in the back, he's, he's uh, so that's why there's this person in uniform back there, so thanks everybody for coming. Um, so. <sighs> It's an interesting time in policing, and I guess uh, um, I did have an op-ed in the New York Times about two weeks ago now about the use of force. I saw some folks had it printed out, and it goes back to um, the genesis of that, in my mind anyway, for me as a writer, goes back to a video I saw of a police incident in Brooklyn that happened in a, in a synagogue. A man in emotional distress with a knife walked into a synagogue in Brooklyn. Uh, the rabbis called the police, and then somebody started filming. And um, what I saw with a deputy commissioner after the fact was, was the video of, of what happened in there. It made the news. And you had a police officer who's a, a conscientious good cop by all accounts, but he's pointing a gun at the man with the knife and saying, drop the knife, drop the knife, drop the knife. And then the rabbis are to the right, and they're saying, um, yeah, I can do my Yiddish accent, but you know, I'm Jewish. Like, why do you have that knife? What, what's, what are you thinking? What's going on? What, why, is there something wrong? And, and then the cop, for his part, is screaming, you know, drop the knife, drop the knife. And then the rabbis are entreating the person. And um, you know, it, en it ended tragically in that the man put the knife down and walked away, but then came forward, grabbed it again, and ran towards the cop. The cop shot him, and the man died. That's not what sparked my, my interest in the incident. It was the difference between the rabbis and the, uh, the cop. Why was the cop issuing these loud orders um, and why were the rabbis entreating the man? And, and it occurred to me it wasn't you know, because rabbis are holier than thou or because they, uh, they, they understand this, this human psyche better. It's because they didn't have a gun. And if you could imagine um, a person with a knife, if... if, if I to that statement. Sorry. <coughs> Sorry. Continue, please. But why? You said, why did they behave that way? Because they didn't have a gun? I, I can't accept that. Okay. So anyway, um, if you have, w w when, when we train as police officers, uh, one of the ways that we're trained pretty uniformly that when something comes to the point where um, you're pointing a gun, it's a life and death situation, you have to be decisive and you have to make your intentions clear. And if you're going to use force, it has to be unambiguous. So you're pointing, drop that knife, drop the knife. And you're making it loud and clear. Um, I've seen it time and time again in all sorts of training. If you are facing a, someone with a knife, if, if I'm like this, as you see me now, and this gentleman in the front row has a knife, and I'm screaming at you, that, <laughs> and I'm screaming, drop the knife, drop the knife, drop the knife, talk like that. then I, I, I think it would be absurd to, to scream those orders like that. It, it would come off as an empty-handed person screaming orders uh, is absurd, and the rabbis are reacting normally in an important way uh, as people who wanted to be safe and didn't understand a situation. And then the police officer was reacting in a way that you, you can issue an ultimatum when you have a, a, a gun in your hand. It's the law is empowering you to do it, and you have the, uh, the ability to make it clear this is a serious situation of ordering you to do something. 
Um, it occurred to me that, that you know, in American policing, um, a lot of times we just take what we've been taught and we do it for decades uh, in, in basic ways and we don't, uh, we don't self-assess. And the op-ed that I wrote summed up by saying we should always have these guns to protect ourselves and to protect the public, right? But um, we should treat the people in crisis uh, as if we didn't have them, right? That it's an insurance policy. It's not a means to uh, impose uh, a will. And uh, the biggest, and so if you could imagine that, it would be a case of, you know, if you don't, if somebody is menacing you with a weapon and you don't have a weapon, instinctively, almost all the time, you'll open the distance, put, try to put an object between you and them. If, and, and, and why are you doing this? What do you need? How can I help you? But you will have, as a police officer, you know, recourse to protect yourself with a firearm. Um, I was going to say that the, the biggest, except for tonight, where we have folks taking umbrage from the outset, uh, the biggest objection I got from that, uh, I thought I had a hard time looking over at, at Alan with, uh, the, with the left wing in Vermont as a police officer. The most vitriolic, angry feedback I got ever as a, as a person in uniform and a leader was from cops in that op-ed. When I, I, I wrote that, I got, uh, John, you can attest to this, right? I mean, the, the hate mail I got from uh, police officers about what I wrote saying, have a gun, but speak as if you don't have a gun. They said, you're just trying to get us killed. Um, you don't take your job seriously. You're not man enough to be a cop. You should turn in your badge. And I, I, I didn't bat an eye. There, there, there are two, I think, strains to that. One was um, that this very old school thought that, that you know, we are the law as the men and women in uniform. We issue orders and people should respect them. And if you're in crisis or not, if it, it, you will do as the police say. We have the right to issue those orders. The other strain, I think, and it's more relevant to the, what I want to talk about for a little bit tonight before this becomes a conversation, is uh, police in America feel really beleaguered right now. Um, I think the... You spoke too fast there. Excuse me? You say police. You, you oh, oh, I'm sorry. Police feel very beleaguered right now in a lot of ways. They, there's clearly uh, a change. If you look at who we're electing in a lot of uh, American cities as prosecutors, right? Um, we're electing reform prosecutors. Sarah George is uh, in, in my Chittenden County State's Attorney is a reform prosecutor. Um, in Philadelphia, Larry Krasner uh, came in on the wave of, of reform. Um, Chelsea Bo Chesie Budin, Chelsea, excuse me for the name, in San Francisco, Rachel Rollins in Boston. And police officers understood where they stood in um, the criminal justice, which is you, you take evidence and you take people, you bring them to a judge, a prosecutor prosecutes, and that's the system. We're not happy with the outcomes of that system in countless American cities. So cops are getting all sorts of different um, messages. You can arrest people day in and day out. I'm, I'll keep on looking at Chief Murad. And we're just not going to prosecute a lot of them, right? If you, there are people who are suffering from mental illness, um, they shouldn't be in the criminal justice system. I've ordered my police officers not to arrest anybody who possesses um, medication assistant treatment medicines for opioid abuse without a prescription. I said that's not in the interest of justice. So I think police, and now they have a chief saying, like, the way you protect your life by pointing a gun at someone with a knife is all wrong. In fact, you shouldn't be doing it that way. And I just said that, you know, we're getting a lot of this uh, mixed messages and uncertainty from our, our critics and reformers. And now, you know, we have a, a chief, like, just telling us, when you pull out the gun the way you're trained and point it and say, uh, drop the knife, that's wrong too. So where I was, I was less sympathetic for the people who just say, tough, we're the police, we're going to issue orders. But very sympathetic to uh, police officers who are like, what, what are we doing in our profession now? Where do we stand in, in policing in America? Um, and I think that, that you know, we owe our, ourselves and our communities and our police that, an explanation. And we're in, a, in flux right now. Um, because it's, it's very difficult to be in a profession where so much is at stake, the work is so critical, the tools are, are, are either coercive or deadly, and yet we don't exactly know what we, uh, what we expect. Um, it's a profession now where, like for example, in Burlington, you're expected to film everything you do, and then hand it over to the government, and the government can use it as evidence uh, against you. So, and that's a basic condition of your employment. It's a big challenge. So someone, they mentioned when they wrote the, uh, they, wh whoever, I have a CAN bio that you can look up online, and it says that I, um, I'm, I, I just submitted my dissertation uh, from my PhD in political philosophy to my committee. 
Um, so it took forever, but now they're sitting on it, making me nervous. We'll see what, what happens with that. Uh, but it's about policing and democracy, right? So it's about uh, what a liberal democracy should expect of its police. And I think that just a few remarks on that, because um, this is the you know, Humanities Council. This is a degree in you know, PhD in philosophy, humanities, so it's kind of apropos. Um, I think that you'll never hear me, and you haven't heard me yet, use the term law enforcement. I don't call myself law enforcement. Uh, I, I don't call my cops law enforcement officers. They, they do enforce the law. But I think that's a very narrow view of what they do and why it's important. I think that um, when people refer to themselves as law enforcement officers, it, it captures something very basic and elemental about what policing is, but it misses what makes policing so important, like the, the ends of policing. So if you're to, to ask me what, and it's what I argue and what I write, that what police do in America, what they ought to do, is the first is protect and rescue people in danger. Your first obligation as a police officer is to protect and rescue people uh, who are facing harms. And if anything, the law just empowers you as an officer to do that, right? Um, and I think that there's this, if you've heard of it, there's this saying, um, Max Weber, the, the uh, sociologist, says, a state is the entity that successfully claims monopoly on the use of force. And I don't know if you folks have heard that, right? I see some nods. Um, I don't think that's true. Um, if you think about it, if there is a child, I'll just give you an obvious case, like a child getting attacked in the street by an adult, and the child's clearly just trying to defend itself, is it only the police that can, that can go rescue that child? I mean, I'll ask the, the, the chief of Mom, Mom, if, if, if you responded to a call where there was a child getting assaulted, and there was an adult doing the assault, and then some bystander came and ripped that person off and threw him to the ground, would you say you had no right to do that? You had to wait till I got there? Probably not, right? So I don't think the police have a monopoly on uh, the use of force in a democracy. I think Weber got that a little bit wrong. I think that any person has a, um, a natural right to defend other than themselves and other um, you know, innocent people, too. Um, the difference is that, that the police embody the state's promise to do that, right? If you agree to enter into a state, you know, this is like, getting to political philosophy, and you agree to give up certain rights and pay taxes and be part of a scheme of cooperation, it's because the state turns the right of one person to protect another person into an obligation to do it, right? But the other thing that follows from that obligation is an obligation to do two other things, do it professionally and do it impartially. These are two citizens that are involved in a dispute or a fight. And if you have to choose a priority, you, you choose the victim over the attacker, but that doesn't mean that the person who's doing the attack has no rights whatsoever. It doesn't mean you get to be sloppy or unprofessional or heavy handed in your use of force. You have to protect yourselves, you have to protect the public. But what makes policing special, in my mind, is number one, the obligation to protect and rescue the innocent. And number two, um, the fact that you have to do it professionally and in a way that just accords the right value to everybody, the life of everybody involved. Um, and I think that when we call ourselves law enforcement, and not police, we lose a little bit of sight of that. And I think we'd be well served as a profession to regain that, that idea. The second power I think that the police have is the power to, um, the conventional one I just talked about, bring people and evidence to a judge. But then the question is to what end, right? The why do we bring people and evidence to a judge? Is it always to uh, punish and incarcerate? Sometimes yes, I mean there are certain things you do where you ought to be uh, imprisoned. But we have this very, very powerful mechanism called the court system, which is supposed to determine to a reasonable degree of certainty whether somebody actually did something or not. And once you determine what they've done, what do you do with them? Like, we're finally coming to some conclusions in Vermont, for example. If you are in jail because you are addicted to opioids, I'm, I'm happy to say in Vermont, you will receive medication-assisted treatment. 43 or 45% of the um, prisoners in Vermont screen positive for opioid addiction and receive buprenorphine or methadone. Because we've realized that like, the state doesn't merely have an obligation to figure out what you did and then put you in a cell for it, but try to correct some of the conditions. So second power of the police is to bring people and evidence to the magistrate. But what the magistrate does matters, right? What the magistrate does bears on the legitimacy of bringing people to him or her in the first place. And then the third power um, 
is, to, in my mind, the most interesting to me, because uh, I don't think we often phrase it this way, which is to, um, to broker and enforce like social cooperation in our public spaces. And I think if you think a lot about what police do, um, whether it's traffic enforcement, some form of traffic enforcement is clearly about safety, you know, whether you're drunk or speeding or something like that. But so much of traffic enforcement is just making people's lives livable in a shared space, right? So much of it is about cooperation. Drinking in public, there's nothing inherently immoral about having a drink on your property versus a sidewalk. Although Chief Muir and I did argue about that for an hour and a half once uh, on the way home from the, I think just, just, just to needle me, apparently. But I do think that there's no inherent uh, moral wrong with having alcohol on one side of the street or the property or, you know, or the other. Um, but and in New Orleans, anything goes, right? But it's, it's about, to the extent to which you drinking and getting drunk is socially uncooperative, right? Protests are an example of um, an event in which, you know, you have a space that's normally uh, consigned to cars driving down or people walking, but there's a, uh, a political need to claim that space. And whether it should be a permitted protest or whether the police should say, you know what, this is an extraordinary circumstance, there's no permit, that's about the cooperative use of, of space. Um, the same thing with countless laws that police enforce, especially in big, dense cities. Um, and I think if we look at where police have a lot of, um, I might say liability, but a lot of difficulties that, that, that we don't always fairly uh, adjudicate the way we ask people to cooperate in spaces. We say, um, you know, protesters have to have a permit, and for that reason, uh, you know, in fact, I'm looking at the ACLU. Even they admit that sometimes you need a permit to have a protest. Occasionally, like I, I like to quote. In fact, I cite their 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 documents when I I say that. Um, but there are times where I don't think we'd ask for one, right? If there was some sort of uh, um, I can think of political circumstances where something happens very very quickly that's of extreme importance to the nation, and people take to the streets. Um, you know, let's say for example, like the, you know, a, a civil rights leader is assassinated. Within an hour, there's a crowd of 1,000. Are we going to say we're breaking this up? You need a permit? I think that's a great time to let that, that protest go. Um, but it's about cooperative uses of spaces. If you, if you were to just claim the intersection every day, and I'll give you an example. Like when um, gay marriage was legalized in, in New York State, not nationwide with the Supreme Court, but in New York State in 2011, um, I commanded the precinct that covered the Stonewall Inn, which was the, uh, the birthplace of uh, gay civil rights, at least on the East Coast, if not the nation. Um, and it was when the riots there happened in 1969, they were a response to police brutality against gays in the Stonewall Inn. Um, you know, it, it was a horrible time for policing and for history and for gay rights in general. And now tonight, in 2011, gay marriage is legalized. There is thousands of people in the street. They are drinking, they're urinating, they're using sound reproduction devices without a permit, and they're blocking traffic. Did I say this is uncooperative use of space? No, I said we had police detectives proposing to their, to their, the loves of their lives in front of the stone wall, and cops doing the can-can with uh, dancers that they were, you know, in 1969 would have been fighting. Um, however, like a few weeks later was the ninth annual March for Vegetarianism. And they said, can we take the street without a permit? And I said, no, you, 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 you can't. And why not? And I said, that, that, like, the, that would be pretty uncooperative. And they said, what do you mean? And I said, we all, this is the ninth annual march. We all understand the precepts of vegetarianism. This is not like a, a major crisis. If you wanted to, to block traffic, we needed to do this in a way that better accounted for, for your intent. So um, you know, we have to be very mindful about the way in which we, and it's a very difficult job, I think, to properly broker social cooperation. Um, and I think if you look at the, um, the star, you remember the Starbucks incident in Philadelphia where two black men were there without buying anything and they were arrested. I think that's another illustrative incident. Um, trespass is a law. And if you are the manager or owner of a property and you have custodial control of it, you can say, I rescind permission for this person to be in this space. And Starbucks had a policy, apparently, if you, know, if you don't buy anything, um, we can kick you out of that space. 
or ask you to leave. And if you don't leave, we can arrest you. Um, and so these two um, African-American men were in the Starbucks in Rittenhouse Square in Philadelphia, which is the nicest neighborhood in Philadelphia, right there downtown. They didn't buy anything. Manager comes up to them and says, um, you know, or maybe just calls the police. They have to leave. We all know how this goes. If you haven't heard the story, just Google it. It comes up very quickly. And the police were very, very meticulous about their approach. They explained the trespass law. They gave the people an opportunity to leave. They acknowledged that the manager has authority to decide who can be in here and had rescinded it. Um, and they actually started, if you look at the video, moving the chairs and tables away from the two gentlemen. So if there was a fight, no one would get hurt with the furniture. Um, so they like very, 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 very fastidiously adhere to all the requirements of the law. And I think most of us, all, Larry Krasner, the reform prosecutor, said, I'm not prosecuting this, right? They were arrested for trespass. So the question is, in your intuitions, if you think this was egregious, and I do, um, what was wrong about it? It wasn't that the law was unambiguous. It wasn't that the officers had any fact patterns wrong. They, they had a, a custodial manager of the premises who was invoking the trespass law. The problem was, in my mind anyway, that, um, that, that, that the reasons that they were giving for brokering that, that type of cooperation, that use of space, weren't reasons that applied equally to every American. And I'll give you a point. Uh, I was in Seattle in Madison. You ever been to, anybody been to Seattle? It's, it's Vermont. There's a tunnel from here to Seattle, like a spiritual, like a, like a, you just get transported from, it's a city in front of the water with mountains around it, super liberal socialists on the city council, Vermont, Burlington, Seattle, all the same. So I was there in, in Madison Park, which is this very, very, very wealthy community there, um, just walking around. My wife and I went into the Starbucks. We, we, we picked up a newspaper without paying for it and read it. Uh, we, went right into the bathroom, used the bathroom, sat there, looked at our phones, didn't buy a thing and left, right? Was anybody ever gonna call the police on us and ask us to leave? No. And I think that one of the biggest challenges police have is when they have these types of laws that they are asked to enforce to like keep our social environments and our shared environments moving smoothly, whether it's protest, drinking, urination, trespass, um, they have tremendous discretion some laws like disorderly conduct are completely underdetermined. Disorderly conduct basically says, um, in fact, why don't I, I feel like Alan could just come up and we could, no, you're not going to do it. You're tired. You're, you're out of the game. Yeah. <laughs> I'm away from that. You're away from that, mercifully. Um, completely underdetermined. It just says basically, like, don't be boisterous. Don't be loud. Don't get in a fight, right? And the police have discretion at two levels. Number one, to determine what being boisterous or loud or excessive means. And then to enforce the law at all. All of these minor offenses from nonviolent misdemeanors down, we have discretion about whether to enforce or not, right? So we have the discretion to enforce disorderly conduct. And not only do we have the discretion, but the law itself is vague, right? Um, but it's, you also do have case law, though. Too. Right, no, 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 so correct. There's, no, there's governing case law, but so and that's a great point. Like the case law for speech in Vermont is uh, up, up in, in, in our county is that for language, the, the, for language to be fighting words, it has to be equivalent to um, throwing a lit match into a pool of gasoline. That's actually the judge's statement. And he's nodding, thank I, I passed the, yeah, right. Um, so, so that does delineate the police powers. And, and, and thank you for bringing that up. But nonetheless, even if the case law, so, so just to push back a little, what does throwing a lit match into gasoline look like in terms of spoken language? Well, according to um, the Burlington Police Department and the, uh, the prosecutors, uh, changing changes and fluctuations in volume of voice is, uh, enables them to uh, perform an arrest on somebody. I mean, political speech. that's not the, the guidance at all that we give to our police officers. And I know that um, Sarah George has a long record of declining to prosecute those types of cases. But the fact that we just can have this uncertain conversation, I think, speaks to the underdetermination of disorderly conduct. And unlike, you know, for example, robbery or something like that, which is threat of force or use of force to take and retain property, right? That's um, the case law around that is much narrower. But when you look at disorderly conduct, even, you know, you talk about modulation of, of voice. That, that is also extraordinarily subjective if you're saying that's the, the test. A match into gasoline. I'm not saying that's a test. That's, that's right. the test according to our uh, current attorney general of Vermont. Right, right, no, no. So, so, right, so <laughs> not fair enough. Supreme Court, not the Vermont Supreme Court. Right. So, 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 right, that's the, that or, um, again, 
I'm sticking with it, match into gasoline. Like, all right, so that's, in fact, the judge's finding. Like, what does that mean on the street? Like, I'm saying, so was what that person just said akin to throwing matches into gasoline, right? And so what we're relying on, and it's why it matters to have good, fair, well-educated cops, is the interpretation of the statute and then whether to enforce it or not. And one of the worries we have as a legacy in America is um, that we oftentimes enforce laws for reasons that don't treat citizens as equals. When we use our discretion or make a determination about the use of space, whether we pull over a car or not, it's for reasons that I think a lot of times you can say to yourself, you know, that, that would apply to him but not me, or me to not him. Or, or if a wealthy person from one of the condominiums in Rittenhouse Square came down into the Starbucks uh, in, in, a, in a shearling coat uh, and didn't order anything, um, I don't think they'd have the police called on them. And so I guess what I'm saying is, as far as uh, American policing, is that um, there's a lot of, of confusion right now about our expectations. Um, I mean, you might, in your mind, know exactly what you want of the police. I'm saying as a nation, we're asking them. We have a president that says one thing, elected officials that say another. Even in Vermont, prosecutor to prosecutor, county to county, it differs. Uh, but one of the things I think would be helpful to uh, get away from, and I brought this up uh, with my initial anecdote is uh, just saying, well, we've always done it this way, so we'll continue to do it this way, which is we're trained that when we're facing a deadly weapon, um, we have our gun out and we, we bark orders because it's a very tense situation and I have to be unambiguous. Like maybe, you know, there's a different way of doing that. The, uh, you know, the, the, I don't, in, in my experience, see British police screaming at people to do things because they, they don't have uh, guns on them. Um, so number one, the way we've always done it is not the way to continue to do it. Number two, um, I think it behooves us all to get away from, we are law enforcement officers, but to what end? I consider myself a police officer, and that means that I, I help regulate situations, diffuse difficult situations, bring people to the attention of the court, broker social cooperation. Law enforcement is only one of the many things I do, and it gives me the power under the law to do it, but it's not the end in itself. So I think we don't want to conceptually entrap ourselves as police officers into thinking we're law enforcement, um, although that's a very important part of what we do. And then the third thing is <clears throat> we have a duty to protect and rescue. That comes first. And if we have to choose between protecting and rescuing or enforcing a statute, I think that the protection of the citizen comes first. And I think that we have to really, the best case to illustrate that is, uh, is drug laws, right? Is, is addiction treatment, is we decided if you have some buprenorphine on you, which is a medication assisted treatment for opioids, and you don't have a prescription, and you're taking it, and clinically it's shown to reduce cravings, save lives, prevent overdoses, is my interest in helping that addicted person take the medicine that'll keep them alive, or enforcing a statute that says they need a prescription for it? If you're saying that our first job is to protect and rescue, then it's, I think it's to, uh, it's not to arrest them. It's to make sure that they get the, the treatment they need. I think that protection and rescue is a duty on the part of the police, and, but it's also a duty that we have to execute very professionally and also according everybody the sanctity of their life. Um, and the last thing, and I just, I'm going back to what I said, is I think that we need to think more carefully about the way we enforce these very low level violations. Not to say we shouldn't, but what's the end of doing it? Is it just to say, that's the law, you shouldn't have been drinking, you shouldn't have been in the street without a permit, we're going to enforce that? Or are you really, really trying to broker social cooperation? The gift that police officers have of discretion is a tremendous, tremendous power that they're given, right? To say, not only is there a law that you have to enforce, but you get to choose whether it's brought to the court or not. That's your choice. And that's a very, very powerful, that's one, that, that is one of the most powerful things in a, in a, in a democracy, I mean, to some extent, like judges aren't even, uh, um, d well, they, they do, but it, it really is akin to a very profound judicial power. And so what I think that we need to do as, um, as Americans and as police officers is when we're brokering these low-level offenses is really understand are the reasons we're providing to people for what we do reasons that treat them as equal citizens, right? Can you say to yourself the reason that that officer just gave him or her or this other person for doing what they're doing, charging or not, um, are they reasons that make them feel as equals? And I think we can go back to a lot of instances in America where we failed that test. And I think we'd gain a lot of trust right away if we really strictly uh, adhere to that rule. So that's sort of like 
from, from a philosophical humanities perspective, like where my head is at with uh, uh, American policing, um, I know there are some people that had some really interesting points to make or disagreed uh, from the outset. But at this point, I guess, um, if anyone has any questions or comments, I'd love to start a conversation. Yeah, please. Yeah, my, my question has to do with this discretion and how it applies to political speech. Because right. from my perspective, Burlington, you know, before you were chief of police, but continuing yeah. while you were chief of police, had a serious problem of not respecting First Amendment rights. Right. And, you know, it's bad enough, you know, to not be respecting First Amendment rights. Right. But when it's being done in an apparently politically biased manner, right. where it seems to be people of certain political views have their speech restricted, whereas people who basically agree with sort of the Burlington establishment, right. the left-wing, you know, pro-democrat or progressive point of view, are allowed to say block traffic, including ambulances. Right. People with other points of views are heavily restricted, such as when they restricted people from protesting outside of women's health clinics but they only stop people from protesting outside of abortion clinics, right. not health, women's health clinics that don't perform abortion. They allowed people to protest outside of other health clinics that didn't perform abortions. Or um, you know, restricting uh, freedom of speech on Church Street, you know, like restricting people from protesting outside of uh, near a Barack Obama campaign table, right. um, and putting people in jail and persecuting for them for that. Or there was a case, I don't know the details of it because no real details were given, but there was a case where they used a Church Street trespass ordinance which actually passed after the Obama campaign right. incident. They, the, the, the guy who prosecuted that case was the guy who introduced it into the uh, city council, uh, the Church of Trespass Ordinance. And they used that against a guy who was, quote unquote, aggressively counter protesting. This was right. when the bus drivers were on strike. Right. And uh, they banned someone from Church Street, I'm not sure for how long, for aggressively counter protesting. Um, I don't think that would have happened had the person's point of view been different from that. Um, for instance, like when the UVM college students were blocking traffic near the hospital. Right. Um, you know, and then I could go on and I can think of like a dozen cases off the top of my head. I won't name some of them because, you know, to protect the privacy of some of the people. Um, but there's cases uh, where, um, you know, people were said they're not allowed to criticize the police in front of the police. Right, um, I, yeah, I, I, like I don't know. When they were holding, you know, they were carrying, uh, or sometimes referred to, erroneously referred to as assault weapons. Um, some of their, I assume they were semi out maybe they're fully out, but I assume they were semi out they're carrying semi out right. rifles in Burlington, and the police told people that they're not allowed to criticize the police while they're carrying them. Um, Come to a question, please. And uh, so, I'm just wondering, what's the, you know, why is there this discrepancy in how political speech is treated in the city of Burlington? So the only person that I've that my police department has arrested for political speech is Ben from Ben and Jerry's because um, he insisted on being arrested. He said, I'm not going to stop re replicating the sound of an F-35 until you arrest me. I remember I was on the, the ski lift at Jay Peak when I got a call from R uh, Robert Appel, the civil rights attorney, mm -hmm. saying, Brandon, when are you guys going to arrest Ben from Ben and Jerry's? And I said, hold on. And I hung up the phone. And I took my mitten off, called up the cops. And they said, yep, he's riding around in a huge trailer blaring all this sound and I, I said okay arrest him um, so at least as far as when I've got we haven't arrested anyone for political speech now you talk about the um, the students the Black Lives Matter students blocking Main Street yeah I said that we were not gonna arrest any of them um, and when we talk about the time place and manner in which you can have political speech they had for weeks been trying to get the attention of their administration they were not able to meet with Tom Sullivan. He rebuffed meeting with uh, those students. They did some protest actions within the UVM building. They were not able to meet with him. And then they went, and for about two or three hours, they, uh, they blocked traffic. Now, one of the things that police do is say, you're blocking traffic. It's going to cause a delay. So get out of the street. I'm going to arrest you. We've actually, until then, had never tested that uh, in um, at rush hour in, in, in Burlington. There's no one who'd actually uh, done it. And I'll tell you, like, they actually did block traffic and they did cause a delay. And I said, if, if you do this again, you, you, you've made, you have on a one time basis block traffic to get the attention of the city and the university because you felt like you were being ignored. And it's about race in America and about feeling ignored as a person of color. And not only do you have a history of ignoring them, but also enslaving them and lynching, segregating. I said, you have a claim on this space for tonight, but you did block traffic and you did delay ambulances and you made your point. If you do it again, you'll be arrested. And you know what they did? They didn't do it again. They said, we're going to take our protest back inside. 
Um, as far as the people protesting in front of Planned Parenthood, like I haven't enforced any of that. But if they're not blocking the doorway and they're not blocking pedestrian traffic, or they're at least allowing people to go through, they can protest about whatever, whatever they want. The charges right? were brought against somebody because they were outside of the protest, the no protest, right. zone, but the vehicle was parked in the public parking spot and they had a pro-life bumper sticker. I, I, I wasn't, I mean, I, I can't adjudicate that, but I wasn't, I wasn't there for that. But I'm, I'll take that at, at face value. Um, political speech should be one of the most highly protected forms of speech, regardless of content. I mean, that's, that's clear. That's different than recreational speech or, you know, playing a trombone or throwing a Frisbee or drinking and, and urinating. I think that we have to give a very, very wide berth for p political speech. And so I, I can't go on a case-by-case -case basis and adjudicate these incidents with you, but well, I mean, yeah. I, I, at least yeah. six cases I've had my free speech restricted. Right. Uh, in the, within the city of Burlington. Right. Um, and I can think of at least six other instances where other people have had their free speech restricted. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I, I, again, like I, I, we have not cited or the only person that has, I've taken any enforcement action against in this regard is, is or dispersed at all. I mean, the, the, you know, is, is, is Ben from Ben and Jerry's. I and mean, that's, I can only say for the last four years and I three was, months. I was forced to leave. I was criticizing uh, Burlington police yes, for carrying some of this. It's okay. No, 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 that's no, he's, yeah. That's, we, can, we can return to that. No, it's not a question per se. He, he's, he's wondering about the, if I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, right? but about the priorities of, of how we prioritize political speech and are we giving, like I just said at the end of my talk, we need to give reasons to treat people as equals. And I, from what I hear you saying is that, that we often don't give reasons to treat you as equals. If you're liberal, you get the nice reason. And if you're conservative, we break up the, the, the march and, and arrest you. That's, that's, I'm saying that has, as in a matter of enforcement, that hasn't been borne out under my leadership. But, but I, I have heard what you're talking about with, with the Planned Parenthood. Kicked yeah. City Hall Park. Yeah. Or not City Hall Park, the uh, waterfront park. Yeah. Right. For criticizing police who are carrying so called assault rifles. You can criticize me anytime Excuse if you want to. Excuse me, though. There are a number of people here that have other issues. And, no, no. That's... And I, for one, would like to ask another question. Sure. Because I, we spend enough time on this personally. And I'd like to give everybody a chance. But one of my major concerns is how we deal with people with mental illness. Right. And if you'd address that, I think that would help this community. Sure. Um, if we're talking about this community, we have the, we, <laughs> the chief of this community made the choice to come here tonight. No. <laughs> no, 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 of course not. <laughs> no, no, I don't mean that. Mental health is, if you ask police officers right now what the biggest crisis is that affects the quality of life in their cities and um, you know, what, what is claiming the most human lives, it, it would be the opioid crisis. But then if you ask them what the biggest long-term problem is in uh, American policing, it's mental health. Mental health intersects with homelessness, intersects with substance abuse, intersects with crime, and the behavioral health crises that people in mental distress have. I mean, if you look at the last two people that the Burlington Police Department shot and unfortunately killed people in mental health crises in 2013 and 2016. Um, one of the things, it's easy for me to say this because it's a state level problem, but there are, there's not enough inpatient mental health treatment available in Vermont. Once the hurricane came and closed uh, the facility, where, where was the facility, Tony? It's up in Berlin. Yeah. Um, that was a, a biblical flood for mental health in, in Vermont. We lost the capacity to give enough inpatient treatment to, to people. Um, we also don't have adequate drop-in or outpatient psychiatric treatment anywhere uh, in the state. And so what you get are, we, you know, we have a gentleman, um, some of you might know him, I, I'm sure Alan could guess his name, but he has had 1,300 contacts with the police in the last seven or eight years. Um, over, oh God, close to 200 arrests, and they're all mental health related because he has uh, episodes where he either gets violent or disruptive or literally like swings tennis rackets at people's heads. Pure childhood trauma intersecting with mental health and alcoholism. The state doesn't know what to do with him, right? Um, so I think we need like a real profound investment. Scholars would be able to talk about this better than me, but it goes back to a legitimate move to deinstitutionalize a lot of people, I guess, in the 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. And then like a pendulum that swung all the way in favor of deinstitutionalizing because we were, we were overdoing it. We now like have a really diminished capacity to give inpatient treatment to the people who need it. And I think police officers get very resentful because for us, it's an externality. There's a system that doesn't give adequate care to people in mental health crises. Um, Vermont is very loath to impose 
medical treatment on people for mental health. It, it takes a very hard to get court order to medicate someone against their will. And then when they are not institutionalized and not medicated and they're on the street in, in our cities, you know, meaning Rutland, Burlington, Montpelier, of course, uh, it's the cops that have to deal with it. And, and I, I don't know if you want to, I, I, just, I often call on John because he leads operations, but do you think our cops feel a bit resentful about just having to deal with these problems again and again? I think they feel stressed by having to address the same folks routinely and feeling like they're not supported at other ends of the spectrum insofar as once they prevent someone from harming themselves or others, what is done for that? And there is no second step. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's bringing folks to the same institutions that have limited resources and put them back out. So if you ask like what we, we have, an, after um, our use of force incident against Phil Grennan where, where we had a four hour standoff that resulted in um, Mr. Grennan coming out of a bathroom with knives in his hands and the police officers shooting and killing him, we developed a really, really, and I mean this, world class capacity to isolate and contain people safely and then negotiate with them it involves, so one of the things that I think separates policing from social work is police don't only have an obligation to, to solve a problem using communications and those types of behavioral health interventions, but also to physically control a scene, right? So if somebody's barricaded, if somebody's locked in a room, if somebody is out in the open but they're armed, you need special tools and tactics to contain them. And that's what we specialize in. And that's what uh, we're getting better and better at every day. And we will contain that person now. Um, you know, if they're in a room armed, if it takes all day, we'll make sure that they're safely contained in the room. We'll negotiate with them. If anything, they'll end up just passing out from exhaustion, and we'll wait for that. But then once you bring that person to, uh, to help, help seems to be very shallow in most cases. Um, you know, we, we went through a big soul searching with these two violent incidents where you have um, a man who killed his uh, um, wife with a hatchet on Hyde Street with a, a cleaver. I was there for that, cleaved her head open and killed her. Um, and then you have a woman who shot the person who's supposed to give her shooting lessons. And both of these people have severe mental health problems. The prosecutor at the state level, at the county level, says, I don't think they're fit for prosecution. The state says, I don't know if I'm going to institutionalize them. The governor says, I think you need to take a second look. And then T.J. Donovan says, why are you dumping this on my lap? I don't mean that in an in a accusatory way. The governor has literally said, I want you to look at what Sarah George declined to prosecute. Like that's a broken system, if you ask me. Um, the system at all of its points was ill-equipped to deal with these very violent people who clearly had mental illness. Is it a prosecutorial issue? Is it an institutionalization issue? Is it a county thing or a state thing? We're still figuring that out right now. Yeah. Add, add something uh, as well. Uh, when, we talk about, when we talk about mental, mental health from a law enforcement perspective, and, and I just, I was in Chicago and Presented with uh, Murray Moulton, who, as well as Kristen Chandler from what we call Team Two, at the IEC, the International, International Association of Chiefs of Police. We did this also back in 2016. Both times, one of the things that I, I talk about though is there is a public expectation or perceived expectation of perfection <coughs> on the part of law enforcement, which further <coughs> exacerbates exactly you know what, what the chief is just saying in terms of like what is the next level of system. What we know so clearly is when something has a <coughs> tragic ending. Everybody knows that. And the question is, the police need more training. Uh, in, in some cases, that very well may be the case. However, what, what is not also out there, which, are the, which is the norm, is the fantastic work that, that our police officers and our troopers are doing every single day with mental health clinicians, with street interventionists, um, and, and nobody knows about that. And, and I'm just giving you one example in my play that was a, uh, from, last, you know, from early in the year. We had a situation where somebody was uh, very severely, uh, severe, severe crisis, had stabbed himself a couple of times. So we had to, in that rescue mode, had to do everything we could to assist. We had uh, EMS, we had um, our, our uh, clinicians from Washington County Mental Health, we had, and we had a negotiator, as well as the other things. Did we get to isolate, contain? That situation ended up um, in, in a very difficult dice situation. We used a beanbag, uh, fired from a shotgun to at least stop the advance against the police because mm -hmm. we had the resources. It's a big difference. I mean, we had multiple officers able to contain and, and manage that. When we did a press release on, and so anyway, he, uh, after that, it stopped the advance, continued dialogue. A little while later, the, uh, you know, the, the, and this is after he also um, was further harming himself. 
uh, and then puts the, but then literally put the knife down. Totally compliant, got him on a stretcher, got him, you know, the, the life-saving help that he needed. And because that was such a, a significant incident, the press didn't cover it. We did a press release on that. Had I said the Montpelier Police Department shots, you know, shot you know, an African-American male or somebody, you know, caller with a shotgun, which is what we did, uh, it would have had a very different reaction. My point is that was a really extreme case. But the other work, when you talk somebody down, when you do all these things that she's talking about, that's what happens. That's the, that's the norm. That's the default. That's the, yeah, that's the default. Yeah, so I just want to say that because, so, but when there are tragic situations, um, in which we always definitely want to learn everything we can, what can we do better? I absolutely support the, the ISAT training, you know, the PERF 30, you know, which you, you were involved with back in 2016, that, you know, and rethinking use of force. That is exactly where we are evolving to. And, I, and, and if you're not from Montpelier, question your departments. How many of your officers are trained as negotiators, even? And I, I will tell you right now from, you know, that there aren't enough that are trained in that. But anyway, I just wanted to say that it's an expectation of perfection. And then where, where we fail as a society is what are we doing for, to quote the governor, Vermont's most vulnerable? And that's who we are all really trying to make. Yeah, and I think there's an important, I mean, I think the chief makes really, really good points because there is this very, very high expectation on police. And there's a difference between police departments that are not up to speed in their training or their policies, their values, their expectations, and then the outcome is a product of that, right? It's the result of being behind the times and being asleep at the wheel and then, and then not uh, responding properly in a crisis. That's a lot, that's different than... Policing is inherently an unstable and chaotic situation, and there will always be instances in which um, an officer's judgment is, officer misassesses the facts, or um, a situation develops faster than we can control it. And I think that a lot of times the public blurs the distinction between, you know, so unfortunately some agencies that just haven't had the uh, incentive to innovate, and then agencies that are really on the ball but have an unfortunate outcome. And then within that, of course, there we've seen it. I mean, there was a very, very disturbing, and this is not about, um, Police thinks about corrections, but if you read Seven Days, very disturbing article about conduct and corrections today. There are also just bad actors, bad employees. If you're a bad employee in uh, um, most businesses, maybe you engage in fraud or petty theft, and policing other people's innocent lives are on the line. So uh, we have a very, very high standard and to meet for recruiting the right and training the right people. But there's three things at work. There's like agencies that are behind the times. Very, very few to no agencies are like that in Vermont. I think we're we're lucky in that regard. And then the bigger cities in Vermont, actually, I think, are, are very much on the ball with contemporary uh, training. Um, and then you just have situations that are just so chaotic that they go beyond your ability to control them. Um, everything is time compressed, and officers are under stress. They have tunnel vision. And then there's just bad actors, right, which is another, another thing that happens in all parts of society. But in policing, it's, it's horrible when it happens because the stakes are so high. Yeah. Um, Either I don't know. You can negotiate who goes. Yeah. 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 So I, the question I have um, is, what are we going to do about the agencies and officers that are behind the times? Because right. that exists in this state. You know, the Randolph police chief beat his wife like a year ago, a year and a half ago, um, and he's no longer the police chief. And um, the Northfield police chief, the town I live in, uh, he planted evidence uh, on a person that he arrested when he was working for Berlin. Like, there are bad actors. Right. And, and, you're, and you're drawing attention to the ones that have come, you know, to the press. Uh, so, more broadly, because, you know, I, I can't I go into the, I'm not going to go into the details of planting evidence allegations in, in Northfield per se, right? But one of the things that folks have to remember is that um, police chiefs work for you, right? And cops work, they, like I work for you, especially if you're in Burlington, I work directly for you, um, not just in some big constitutional way. Um, and, and the point is, I think that, um, you know, I'm appointed by a mayor and approved by a city council. And, and a lot of times, if you look at the reaction in the press or the way activism goes, it goes directly from the uh, um, from the citizen to the to the chief of police, or from the citizen to the cops. So the protests, the news will be writing about the police. The question in my mind that never goes uh, answered is like, what do city councils and mayors 
expect when they appoint chiefs of police? What kind of men and women are they appointing? What kind of standards are they holding them to? How are they evaluating them? What kind of metrics are they going to use for performance? And, and one of the disservices that I think police traditionally have done, and I'm, I'm looking at, you know, how, how many years have you been doing this? 34. 34. God, I want to tell you, how I, I feel like a young in. Like I'm, I'm up like 20, 23 years. So um, 34 years, 23 years, especially like right in the 90s and the 80s, cops were like, listen, you don't understand what we do. You can't understand what we do unless you've walked in our shoes. And we would not only say that to citizens, not only say that like, if you're single, you want to impress somebody at the bar, you'll never understand what I've seen. You know, and then give them the thousand yard stare. Um, they, we would also say that to our, our elected officials. I mean, not in so many words, not disrespectfully, but you'd say like, Mayor, listen, this is policing. Crime goes up. You're going to have a hard time getting reelected. And don't worry, I got it. I'm the chief. Don't, you can't quite understand what we police do, but hey, we got it. And, you know, don't worry about it and don't question what we do. And it's something that it takes, it takes decades to learn the, 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 you know, the truth of, I mean, you agree sort of with what I'm saying? I'm trying to, the, 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 there's a mystique, there's always a mystique about policing. So one of the things that we're liable for is not empowering our elected officials to understand how to, how to lead us. And one of the things I said to my mayor was like, whether you like it or not, my job is to teach you enough about policing that you, understand the standards, that you'll basically be responsible for my decisions, you know, not, not in a, in a like, sleight of hand way. So I think t to answer your question, like, citizens need to not just to hold the police accountable, but to hold the men and women who appoint the police accountable. Like, I'm under the executive branch. I'm in the executive branch of government. I have an executive branch boss. That boss appoints me. That executive branch city council uh, approves me. And, and if you, you're not satisfied with me, like, there are men and women who gave me this job. And then we also have to make sure that they understand the expectations, these elected officials, and the police owe them an explanation of what we do so they can make the right educated decisions about our actions, right? And I think we've gotten away with a lot by keeping that all murky and obfuscated. Um, but I think that the chain of command is actually pretty clear, and it begins with the citizens. Yeah, and that's yeah. helpful to hear because I think that I've heard from a lot of representatives that they're not willing to take this oversight of our police agencies. Right, and, and so I know the hand go up. So just to be clear, I also don't, that, right, that doesn't necessarily mean like that I, I would like outside citizens or elected officials like directly imposing discipline on cops. Like meaning like a board of, like there's no other government agencies I know where like just a group of citizens like disciplines the employee. But nonetheless, we need to have, again, I'm just picking because I'm in a city, mayors and city councilors who know what to expect of us and hold us accountable for it and choose chiefs based on, um, on, on, on a really well-educated view of what the citizens expect and what chiefs ought to be able to bring to the table. I think that's, I think we're missing, I'm just reiterating that. I think we're missing a little bit of that. You, you, you had your hand up for it, yeah. Um, and then, that's actually a really great setup. What's running through my mind is also what you said earlier about the scenario with the rabbi right. and the police officer. And one state that has acted to draw a line, so to speak, that you're talking about is California right. with their use of force as last result. And I'm afraid I'm not terribly familiar yet with that law. But I welcome your thoughts about how helpful or unhelpful that would be and why. Yeah. So the Supreme Court case that governs uh, use of force, the U.S. Supreme Court, not Vermont Supreme Court, is Graham v. Connor, Graham versus Connor, and it talks about the um, is the use of force reasonable from the perspective of of a reasonable officer who had the knowledge that that a cop would have had in that situation. I mean, do you follow what I'm saying? Like, I'm in the middle of a situation. It's time compressed. I'm under stress. I'm confronting the facts as they come to me. I'm an average police officer. I make a decision and I use force. The Supreme Court says, is that force reasonable based on the perspective of a, of a, um, a I'm being legally imprecise, but an everyday police officer who knew what the police officer at the time knew, right? That's the standard. And it's a standard that is, um, you know, very permissive in the use of force. It, it, the, you, the officer who's having the facts tried against him or her just has to articulate, number one, they have to be shown as just a reasonable officer. And number two, they have to show that they had a certain knowledge of the facts at the time, and that they feared for their safety or someone else's safety and they used force, right? And there's not any distinctions about the, the, 
expertise of the force, the professionalism, the quality. It's, it's a fairly, when I say a low bar, I don't think it's inappropriately low. It's the, it's the nation's bar for many years now. But what California did was, was raise that a bit. One of the things they did to change it was say it's not a reasonable officer, but a reasonable person. It took the standard away from the officer and put it into the, the citizen's hands. Um, I think that what you'll see, by, by way of answering your question about what I feel about that, police in a lot of places have resisted imposing standards in their own agencies that are above the Supreme Court standard. They worry with the, what the unions would say. They worry that it would hamstring them. They worry that like cops may hesitate to use force that would have been constitutionally allowed um, because of a, a higher standard, and that might result in cops getting hurt. Um, however, we're finding that that as as citizens, um, Americans are less and less comfortable with what is this prevailing standard. And so you're seeing in places like California, the state. You could always impose a higher standard than the, but when it comes to according citizens' liberties or protections, you can always impose a higher standard than the Supreme Court. You can never go below it, right? That's basically how the law works. So what, what California did was impose a higher standard. And I think that police can have one or two approaches. We can all just hunker down and wait for individual states to impose higher standards in the Supreme Court, maybe have a new Supreme Court case. Or we can go back to what I said in the beginning about um, um, what our duty to protect means, and that's to professionalize. We can, or we can ourselves say we will train ourselves in a way that, that raises our standard ourselves. And you're seeing a lot of police agencies actually passing their own use of force policies that are similar to, they don't have the exact same phrasing as California's, but they're like Camden, New Jersey, Seattle, New York City, um, and we're drafting a new policy in Burlington, have um, written standards that, that, that um, professionalize us at a, at a higher bar than the Supreme Court. But cops worry about that. Because when it comes down to it, if their life is on the line, they'd rather, just any human being would say, if it's good enough for the Supreme Court, it's good enough for me. And then Americans are pushing back on that right now. Please. Me? Yeah, yeah, of course. You're talking a lot about um, municipal police. Right. A great many of us live out in the boonies. Right. And for us, our local police force is the state police. Yes. I had the privilege for 10 years, starting in 2005, being representative from Callis on the Central Vermont State Police Community Advisory Board. Right. And it's not one of those things where the, where the citizens are trying to control or judge the police. There was a genuine effort, depending on the Middlesex Station commander, and I experienced Four, uh, three or four different commanders, various levels of interest. Is there within the municipal things the same outreach to communication and more integration of the police and the community? Yeah, so it varies from municipality to municipality. And I, I wonder if, if uh, Chief Fakos wants to ring in about Montpelier. But um, in Burlington, we have a um, um, police commission, which is seven uh, citizens. Um, living in Burlington, actually at this point it's, it's six out of seven people of color, so it was always very diverse. Now it's, it, I mean six out of seven is a fraction of minority representation in Vermont is like unheralded. Um, but the point is like what I did when, when I got to be the chief is um, I gave them access to all of our civilian complaints. So anytime a civilian complaint is made, the, um, the police commissioners get to view it, inquire about it, ask questions about the disposition. They also get access to all of our internal investigations. They also get briefed on all of our promotions and our uh, um, um, hires. I'm sorry, you're going to follow up. It wasn't just about yeah. dealing with complaints. Yeah. They were, we had some amazing presentations and programs. Different right. parts of the state police came and gave us presentations. It was, and we were to go to our select boards and continue that. Process. Yeah. I think that's really important. No, and I think it's, 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 it's done ad hoc, right? So I talked about our transparency with discipline, but we also um, um, run a citizen police academy. And I, when I say citizen, I use that word nominally. I use that in the, like the, the classic sense, not like you have to be a citizen. And, and so you know, we run this. How many weeks is it, John? It's like 10, 10 weeks? It's eight. Uh, eight weeks, uh, four hours a night, once a week. And anybody can, can uh, enroll and you get a soup to nuts like front to back view of everything the police department does. We run that once a year. We run another one for youth. 
Uh, we also run a, uh, a bi-monthly interfaith clergy and community luncheon where people can come and it's open. There's no agenda that I bring, so anyone can ask anything that's on their mind. But this just, it varies from agency to agency. Look, looking back in my own history, I was a hippie, okay, right. back in the 60s. <laughs> and I grew up respecting police, and then something happened. And I think this need to kind of heal that divide. In general. When do you think that happened? Like, what, what, what time frame? This is the late 60s. I was in graduate school in Madison, Wisconsin. Right. Tear gas was flying. Sure. It was, it was not a happy For you, that was the 60s was the time where there was a cleave. Yeah, yeah. Where, where it came apart. And it, because it was, it was feeling like there were some laws that were unreasonable. Right. And so our method of protesting, you know. No, I mean, listen, there's a lot, you see the photos of the, especially in the South, of the police unleashing dogs on protesters, right? Or yeah. municipal agencies hitting them with fire hoses. So like the, yeah. Need, need mm -hmm. that. I mean, yeah. that legacy is there. Sure. Anyone, please, sir. I think, for me, there's an elephant in the room here that has to do with the two recent police shootings in the, in, the, in the high school, by the high school, a few months back, and then uh, up off Oak Street. Clearly an emotional problem. And all the discussions that I've had with neighbors since is a kind of, uh, in my case, kind of fear. I got stopped a while back for a taillight deal. And when the cop, when the officer, came by, I rolled down the window and put both my hands on the edge of the window. I just don't feel as safe as I did before those two events hurt, were heard. And I don't know about having a negotiator. I don't know about why the hell you can't get anybody out of the way, you know, and, and just take you eight hours right there in the mud. But to blast away, and so many people know the fellow up here on Oak Street that was killed, that, and whatever you want to say. Um, the elephant for me is an un, a new level of unease within the community and my relationship with the police. I've been here 20 years and have never really thought much about it. I've just assumed a kind of almost pal relationship with a policeman. I mean, that has been not shattered, but has, it has been um, crumpled up a little bit. And um, <coughs> when you talk about drop the knife, drop the knife, drop the knife, uh, what does it take to get a negotiator there with a mic? or a, I mean, a megaphone and get everybody else out of the way. Yeah, and I, I think that, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying and, and I understand, I think a lot of people um, echo your sentiment. What's really troubling to me is a lot of the shootings that we see in Vermont uh, by police or against people that turns out they have what looks like a very real gun and it turns out to be a BB gun. And I'm not saying, police, you can't know that. You can't, when, when somebody's pointing this thing at you from 10, 20, 30 feet away, you're not, it takes 10 pounds of pressure, seven pounds of pressure, six with an index finger to, to fire a gun, and anybody can end a life with that. And to say, is that a real gun? Is that a BB gun? Are they a good shot? Are they not? Are they really looking to get me or themselves? Um, very, very, I, 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 when you notice when I wrote that op-ed, I wrote about people with knives, right? Um, even the most progressive training in the U.S. that talks about the escalation, like ICAT training, draws the line at anything that looks like a gun. And I think that a lot of the tragedies we've seen, in hindsight, we go, that person was struggling with mental illness, and uh, it turns out it was only a BB gun. But I don't, um, I don't expect a cop to have x-ray vision and know whether that's a BB gun or not. Can you ever shoot somebody in the knee? <laughs> so I wish I had a brochure for this, because I get asked this like, <laughs> <laughs> I can, I can yeah, yeah, why not? Hey, how about it? <laughs> uh, you know, first of all, you know, the, the, uh, with both those incidents, I mean, we, they, they were the individuals, you know, the first one, the high school one, we were once going back to, you know, doing our fundamental duty. We had a bank robbery, an armed bank robbery. 
and we had a school resource officer on scene uh, outside the school. So our so multiple priorities are happening. We're, we're protecting the school first and foremost. Then all of a sudden we identify you know, the, 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 the bank robber. And it was all about containment. I was incident commander at that point. I was the incident commander at that point. I had plenty of resources. But, I, but the, what I did not have, I did not have a way to effectively communicate. So my school resource officer is one of my negotiators. He, for over an hour, with no gloves on and, and not the usual heavy ballistic protection, is yelling back and forth, trying to contain and calm the person as best we could. And what I was waiting for was an armored vehicle that I had requested. It was part with this, along with the State Police Tactical Services Unit because that was the only way we wanted to effectively get close to that person safely to, to have better dialogue. We can do that with a robot. We can do that with an armored vehicle. But if we did something, approached and, and precipitated an action, that was something where time, just time, and we, and we did the best we could there. He was the one that changed the dynamics and, and that all the details are all out there. Um, and it was, it was tragic. And then sometimes, uh, you know, and, and is that a what they call a spontaneous uh, suicide, suicidal thought? Like in other words, that was a bank robbery. There was a getaway driver that was later arrested and, um, and, but it had, a, once again, it had a tragic outcome, but I didn't have the resources to effectively negotiate. I had a negotiator, we did what we could, and then the dynamics changed before I got those other resources. Um, and, and the primary resource I was waiting for was an armored vehicle, a Bearcat, coming from the Vermont State Police Barracks in Williston. Um, and then as we were trying to uh, get, you know, take some next steps, to, um, it just, all of a sudden, he changed the dynamics with what he did, and we had to respond to that. Um, the, the incident that happened here at the roundabout, the tragedy, we were responding to, once again, a violent crime in progress. The, two, the only two officers on responded to somebody. If that's labeled as a violent crime in process, from all I've heard from conversations, of, and this is, I wasn't there, or I don't zip about the tension of they've been right. on all, duty all night, but can you get out of the way, you know, and go with a megaphone? And rather than drop the gun, drop the gun, drop the gun, bang, bang, mm -hmm. um, maybe a, a female voice, maybe, you well, know, sir, good yeah, morning I, I, I respect what you're saying, but uh, going back to, to what Chief DePozzo said in the very beginning about rescue and, and the emergency, the help, somebody called us because they were, their apartment was being forcibly, uh, gentleman was trying to force his way into an apartment with a knife. That was what the, my two officers were responding to. The only two officers on duty, and the only, the only other on duty police officers were in Barry City at that time of day. Um, so, so when they ended up trying to de escalate, and that, is, that was also in the video that the city has released, they're telling the, he, you know, first of all, the officer, can, you know, he's, got a, he's got a gun. So it's not, not a knife anymore. But they also, when they, when they took opportunities to, they said, what is your name? How can we help you? Um, you know, part of our training, ideally, is to have only have one voice. You know, whether you're a negotiator or not, and somebody's in crisis, just like, you know, the, 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 you know, the analogy with the one police officer saying, drop the gun, drop the gun, and, and the rabbis you know, are also, why are you doing this? You know, somebody's in crisis. You, you, we try to de-escalate, but we want that one focal point. But they did what they could. There was traffic. We have a full backdrop of all those apartments from the officer's perspective over on Spring Street to also a nursing home and, and apartments all on the other side. And the person at that moment was, was actually, this gun was actually a direct replica. It was probably molded out of a Beretta firearm, a 9mm firearm. Um, you know, those officers also have an obligation to go home at the end of the day. And one of the things we also talk about is a below 100 initiative. We, you know, we're trying, our national goal is going to get below 100 line of duty deaths. You know, we're, we're, no, we're not there yet. But my point is, um, and this is also what could be helpful for me as police chief, now that you know just a little bit of, of those circumstances anyway, and, and these are very, you know, but yet you have this fear suddenly. You have, you have a different perception of the Montpelier Police Department. 
you know, when, our response to, to, uh, to, the, to the bank robbery was the first time we, you know, we were ever involved in, in a deadly force situ officer-involved shooting in the history of the department. We've had officers shot, you know, shot at, um, but that was the first time that's ever happened. And then fast forward, a year and a half later, I'm faced with this situation. And, and, and it's like, so it's important for me to understand too, is how can I help alleviate, build that trust? I, I deeply appreciate the, the range of new facts that I was unaware of in terms of the background and, and you know, the fact that uh, there are just two guys there. Uh, and I, I thank you for the, your patience and understanding. And as I said, I can have no way, I have, hundred years ago I was in the army for three years. Okay, I have no sense of what you guys are up against every day if something isn't quite right. Uh, well, that's what we don't want, to, like, like what she was saying, we don't want to have that, uh, you don't understand what we do or whatever. We are in an era of, of a variety of things happening. Number one, we are trying to be transparent, how we're trained, how we choose our police officers. When we promote, now the last time we did a full-on sergeant's promotion in Montpelier, we also brought in people um, from, out, from the community to participate in that. I told the candidates, basically focus on the president's 21st century policing task force report, six pillars, what does that really mean? That's, it makes, I don't, you know, and then we told the community, ask them those kinds of questions. Those are the real questions. But also what we're trying to do is, again, it's a, it's a give and take. We are your police, so when you have these fears, I need to, you know, to understand better what, why that fear is, because you know um, we had two very difficult situations. Um, my officers acted admirably; we did everything we could, and I certainly wish it didn't happen that way. Gosh, do I wish that didn't happen mm -hmm. that way? Yeah. But again, for for you or any member of the community to suddenly <coughs> feel, and some of it's normal uh, because we had we've got a good gag. We have basically have a gag order on us on the police while all the other conversations and the, and, the, and the misinformation goes out there. We are waiting for the Vermont State Police in this case to conduct a very thorough investigation. Give, it, give this, the Attorney General the opportunity to take that investigation and the state's attorney, what do we have here? And to make sure, and meanwhile, you know, if you, if you, you, know, you, you saw Major Trudeau from the Vermont State Police actually in that first press conference. And that was really hard for me because this is my community, this is my department, but that was the right face. You know, we were there, you know, later on, but my point is, is that, um, you know, we, we just want to make sure that we have that ability to, you know, when the question, you know, when you have questions, yeah, it's an elephant in the room. Um, and, and it's, because it's, this is a really un, un, tragically unfortunate situation <coughs> or situations that occur in Vermont and in Montpelier specifically. Um, but then how do we, move on. And this is also where, um, where are those resources? How do we do a better job making sure when somebody is, is whether it's addiction, you know, we, you know, or mental health issues, do we have the appropriate resources? And, you know, like we, people that talk about the, you know, the Memphis model of crisis intervention teams, one of the things they have is 24 hours, somebody's in crisis, the police are specially trained, but, you know, they have an additional week of training, but then they get somebody right to doesn't matter time of day, a center that has the psychological support. In, in, for us in Montpelier, you know, we either bring a screener out to us in the field, in the, you know, that Team 2 model to help somebody in crisis, because the police are only there primarily for safety, and secondarily, if there's some legal issues, you know, like for example, if they have to write an emergency uh, or, uh, warrant for somebody, but other than that, it's up to, the, up, to, up to the emergency room, the emergency department to be, you know, because we don't have, we can't just take them to that hospital, even though we have a psychological, you know, the psych hospital here in Berlin. You know, so these are all the things that, that we're all wrangling with. And I think, you know, so not only do we, should anybody, any citizen say, What's, what are my police doing? But also, what are the other systems? You know, years ago, uh, you know, substance abuse issues. There was a backlog, six months in Burlington, you know, and then, and, but we had no black backlog in, in Montpelier, but the public didn't know that. You know, so again, it's all these things and it's communication and openness to say, are we doing everything we can for all, everybody in our community? So anyway, that's.
I just want to say I am so glad I came to this meeting. Yeah. And I'm so appreciative of that. Getting a sense of the scenario and how, how they unfolded and the bureaucracies beyond your own department, which you're up against. And I just want to say thank you again. That's a great thing to end on. We're, we're over time. Uh -huh. It's such an important topic. I know everybody really wants to talk, but we are at the end of the library's closed. And <laughs> <laughs> You're all trespassing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.